Battles, Bricks and Bridges is a community-driven project exploring the rich heritage, history and culture of Kalesher and Cleanish areas in South West Mana. Kalesher and Cleanish community associations partnered together to secure heritage lottery funding, drawing in other common interest partners, including Queen's University, Fermanagh District Council and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. After months of planning, the project began with a community information evening, where the aims and the hopes of the project were explored. Local residents from the wider community were able to ask questions and offer up their own ideas and information. Wider community engagement was further enhanced by a series of local storytelling events, where people shared their own knowledge of the local history and folklore. With local communities now actively engaged, activities on the ground began in the fields around the Arnie Bridge. This is the end of day one and what we've done, we've opened up the first trench here. Uh, the first trench measures about 10 metres by 2 metres. And basically we've put that trench here to try and locate the 19th century schoolhouse. Can we get the time there, we're going to explain the whole process of archaeological excavation to you. We're looking to identify the different colours of the soils and we call them deposits, okay? So what I want you to do when you're digging, I don't want you sticking holes as if you're going for Australia, okay? In the ground, archaeology builds up in layers and it's our job is to peel back each layer one at a time. Once you fill your bucket up by half full of soil, just dump it on the spoil heap. Uh, my name is Catherine Scott and I'm the Learning and Access Officer at the Museum in Enniskillen. Uh, and today is the second day where we've had children out from four local primary schools uh, excavating a local school uh, no longer in existence and also looking at some cottages uh, which used to be, I suppose, what people would refer to as Old Arnie. Can you tell me what, what are you doing here this morning? Uh, we're looking if this here area is a, is a part of a schoolhouse. And, and tell me exactly what are you doing there with the trowel? We're scraping the mud mo mo away so we can see the fine pottery and get deeper to see. And have you ever done anything like this before? Uh, no. And how does it feel like? It's dirty. It feels very dirty, yeah? Yeah. And are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's good. And why do you think this is important to think about the, the history of the, the place where we live? Um, maybe because of our grandparents, what, what our grandparents could have done and what was happening later. What is that? 200 years ago. Great. Okay, well, carry on. Enjoy it. Thank you. Oh my God, it's so messy. I know. I have a book. You're so sorry. Oh, look. It's getting really muddy down there, is it? Yeah. My name is Lynn McCare. I actually work for the School of Education at Queen's, but I'm a, an archaeologist and I'm interested in national schools. And whenever I found out that the Arnie project was underway and that they were going to dig uh, a national school, it was very exciting because it's the first national school that's been dug in Ireland. The National School was part of the national system of education that was introduced in 1831. It continued right up until partition in Northern Ireland and in fact the national school system then continued in the Republic after partition. And it was the first attempt at uh, providing education for children generally of the poor um, at a subsidised rate for many of them and where children of all religions were educated together. Here we go. Put your hand up. You've got the best find of the site so far. That's the best find of the site so far because this is what the kids are using to write on. You ever hear your grannies talking about writing with slate and chalk? Well, this is a bit of the slate here and look kids. You see the lines going across it? So that's a writing slate. We're um, excavating an old schoolhouse here. 
and we're trying to find pieces of pottery and stuff like that. And what about finding out about the past and the history of the place where you live? Do you think that's useful, important to you? Yeah, because then we can tell our children, they can tell their children, they can tell their children and so on. Okay, and tell me a little bit about what you're actually doing. You've a trowel there and you're on your knees. What is it you're doing at the moment? We're trying to like take away some of the clay and try and find bits of red pottery and stuff like that. And, some, and this is, they think this is part of a wall that was here, the wall of the, of the schoolhouse. And uh, is this something you think you might like to do more of later in life or maybe as a job, looking at history and, and the archaeology? Like yeah, I'd like to dig up stuff. I like because it's fun and you get mucky and I like getting mucky. Well, according to documentation, the school behind originally was comprised of um, one school building uh, which had two rooms for the master and one classroom and it was 37 feet long. It was built of brick and lime and it was thatched. And that was, school was established in 1847 and by 1851, the school comprised two rooms and the master's dwelling had disappeared so they'd obviously taken the master's dwelling into the schoolroom. So by that time they needed two teachers. These are copies of documentation that are stored in the Public Records Office in Northern Ireland and the first is the application for payment of teacher salary and for supply of books and it's really very interesting because it doesn't just tell you when the school was established which is 1847 but then it also goes on to tell you details about the school that it was built of brick and lime and that it was thatched and about the size of the school and the schoolmaster's accommodation and it also details um, the furnishings that were in the school the desks and the forms for the children and then there's a handwritten letter which is really quite difficult to read from uh, Father Mason who was the parish priest and also the manager of the school and he's querying the teacher's salary um, about the payment of it and the final document is also very interesting because it is for um, the application for the salary for a needlework teacher for the older girls and this was received in 1852 and by that time then it shows that the school actually now has two rooms instead of one room and it has an attendance of 52 males and 50 females so there are over 100 children at the school. There's orange stuff in the clay. Orange stuff in the clay? That's come out of, you ever heard of dredging? Yeah. Dredging where they left all the stuff out of the river to give it shape. And you get lots of wee bits of sand in it washed in, and all this stuff is this grey stuff. It's called silt, and it's good for and it's good for making little balls with. Like plaster sheet. We aren't sure why the school closed. Um, it is thought to have closed around 1910 because that's when the replacement Arnie National School opened. So it's likely that children seamlessly migrated from one school to the other and it probably um, fell out of use because of the repair of the school because it's not that there weren't enough children because the, the new school was opened so it is probably something to do with the condition of the building. My name is Dermot Redmond and I work for the Centre for Archaeological Fieldwork at Queen's University in Belfast and uh, a site supervisor here. Right now we're standing in a cottage that was uh, abandoned around about the 1940s, 1950s and we have the kids in and they're helping us clean it out. We want to find out more about how people lived, something of their standard of living and the kids are you know, up close to the fireplace, that was where the sort of hub of the house. So we want to find out as much as we can about uh, the flooring, the wall, how the fireplace was constructed. Well, my mother, she came from here, from Arnie. Her uh, grandfather would have been a Keenan. And Keenan's owned these houses along here. They, there were 16 houses along here, and they owned those houses. And they lived here in the centre of this. That was the home house. So that's where they lived. I first came up with my mother and father in 49 from Cork. And from 50 onwards, I came up on my own from Cork. And that meant taking a train to Dublin, taking a taxi across Dublin, and getting a train from Dublin at that time to actually in a skillin. I was uh, eight at that time, the first time I started coming on my own. I was an only child, so there was no telephones. 
So I'm just wondering about my parents. I wouldn't need my son to do it now, but I was left out, an only child, to travel up the country. There was no way of contacting the people here. So when I came here, um, I helped, in inverted commas, around the farm, but I'd done a lot of fishing on the river, travelled up and down the, the river. Uh, I would have helped with bringing in the cows for the milking, a little bit of work with lapping hay, uh, uh, turf, cutting turf. I suppose not a whole lot, but I thought I was important and walked away with them. So this was a row of cottages. All right. And this one, as we were saying, has only recently been opened up. And there's clues sort of very easily when they're you go in. Yeah, there's broken windows. Okay. How do you think they're heating this house? Fire. Fire. fire, okay, so there's a fire in here and there's a fire in here. So there is an upstairs, okay, we can see there's an upstairs. We can actually see the roof from here. What's the roof made from? Steel. Okay, like iron, corrugated iron, okay. Let me come into the kitchen. Now, I was saying to the last group, this is a very special type of sink. It has a very specific name. You had one, do you know what it's called? Sure. It begins with a B, after a city in Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Belfast. Belfast. Okay, so this is called a Belfast sink. Now, the house had a central kitchen, we call it. Some of the floor was cemented, but half the floor was just red bricks stuck into the ground. There were three small bedrooms downstairs. You could hardly fit a single bed in these little rooms, but there was a parlour, or the room as they call it. This was the important room in the house that was never used. It was just mainly kept in for maybe when the priest came to visit he was brought into the room for his breakfast or whatever. There was also a loft. Now, I was just up in the loft once, and I was here, it was very dilapidated, falling down in that. And uh, there was, of course, no toilets. There was no running water. The water came up from the river in a bucket, and we drank that water straight from the river, no purification or <laughs> chlorination or fluoridation, <laughs> nothing like that. So that was, that was really it. The important reporter from, guess what year? 1982. 1981, actually. Florence's seal, if you're going into the town, you know where the Clinton Centre is? Yeah. Okay, and there's nothing in the shop now, but it was Cellini's, like a cafe. Florence's used to be there, a big, big shop. Uh, look, you can see all the different things. Ladies' fashions, men's fashions, I remember it really well, which is really sad. So that's a further bit of evidence in terms of when the house was last lived in. I'm not going to stick my hand too much into that cupboard. Tell me, what is it you're doing here today? An archaeologist dig. And uh, what type of building is it that you're excavating here? A cottage. A cottage? Okay. And uh, can you tell me any more about it? Was it a single cottage or a row of cottages? Or do you know? Yeah, there's a big row. I think it was 16 cottages, doesn't it? Yeah. 16 cottages in all. And what sort of things have been found in this house so far? So I found a button and some glass and some turf. The last time I would have stayed here would have been about, um, I think, 67. And of course, when my uncle moved out, the back wall fell out of the house, the roof fell in. So I'm really looking forward now to seeing, is it really the way it was? Does my memory coincide with what's here? I have my own ideas, but I'm just waiting to see, is it, is it the way it was?
bridge here, it looks fairly uh, straightforward country bridge, um, but there's hints that what you're dealing with is a bridge that goes back into the 17th century. How exactly old the bridge is, however, is up for uh, consideration. There are things about the bridge which suggest to me that you're dealing with a bridge of early 17th century construction. If you look at the underside of the bridge, along the walls you'll see that there's a series of corbels jutting out. If I was to go to, let's say, a late medieval friary or a late medieval tar house, they're the sorts of corbels that I would expect to see associated with the timber framework used for the construction of a wicker work centred vault. It's a classic Irish construction technique of the late medieval period. The construction technique itself is fairly straightforward. What you do is you have your stone corbels and on those stone corbels you have the framework and the framework takes the form of what the vault will look like whenever it's finished. And it's usually a barrel vault. The next thing is on top of that framework, they will put down uh, mats, wicker mats. And those wicker mats then are used for the, to keep the mortar that's poured down. They then take the stones that's, that are going to make up the arch of the vault and they bed those, tooth them down into this. And then they pour more mortar on top of that and they leave the whole thing to set. And if the builders have been doing their job right, they come in, they take away that timber framework and the vault should stay up. And very often they don't bother to take away the wicker work mats because they're still part and parcel embedded into the mortar. They'll just plaster over them. And so you have this bridge with these corbels jutting out. And the question you have to ask yourself is, are we looking at evidence for the first phase of construction work here? At a time maybe in 1610, 1620, when the decision was made to build the bridge and they employed Irish masons to do the work. And those Irish masons, they would have been using this technique I think that you've also got a situation in the 18th century that the top half, the top part of the bridge is taken away and rebuilt on those old medieval pillars and hence the corbel stones survive but above that the parapet area uh, of, and the deck of the bridge probably date to the 18th century. Concerted efforts by the local community managed to get Arnie Bridge formally recognised as a listed building with an ongoing commitment to maintain it. Well, as I say, this is a very old bridge. It's uh, built back in the 1600s, so we believe. So um, some of the bridge has been damaged and uh, we've been tasked with uh, the restoration of the bridge, replacing the damaged sections and uh, repointing, taking the old sand and cement, which wasn't traditional, and uh, taking it out and replacing it with traditional lime water. We concentrate on getting the stone back lake for lake where, where we can and where stone is needed. We try and source it at the, uh, at the bridge here where we're maybe taking it from the water or whatever. It's mostly a sandstone. Some of it's like a river stone, it's like a black stone, it's been washed down the river, but 90% 90, 90 of it seems to be a sandstone. Well, the lime water is special because of its, uh, the way it can breathe and uh, it can uh, absorb the water and, and dry out quickly. Plus it was uh, a mortar that was used uh, at, the, at the bottom of the bridge, so they want to, to replace it lake for lake. Arnie Bridge is important because it's the oldest known bridge in Fermanagh. You've got a bridge which has been in use for you know, certainly 350 if not 400 years. It's an important monument to what happened in the 17th century here in Fermanagh and the way that the county changed in the aftermath of the plantation. You've gone from the late medieval Gaelic society to this new society with these newcomers coming in blending with the, the native Irish population and something new is created. This monument really is a, a memorial to what was happening at that time. You've got these bridges being constructed at that time to improve communication in the county. And so you have a rare survival because in many cases the bridge would maybe be 
taken down and a new bridge constructed in the 18th century, a wider bridge constructed. And now here we have at Arnie this rather narrow bridge and it's a survival. And there in gives it its rarity and that's why it's important that we preserve it. At the time when this school was being used, you know, from the 1830s onwards right up to 1910, it's a different social structure. Education is a completely different concept to it is now. Education is the be all and end all for parents thinking of their children to succeed. At this stage, education wasn't maybe um, aspired to as greatly as it is now. Children could uh, stop going to school if they went in the first instance when they were maybe sort of 12 or 13 years of age. You know, we think of schools now as sort of providing an education, providing a wider social and societal context different ball game altogether. You know, there was one schoolmaster. In this school alone, we have over 100 kids in two classrooms, you know, which was probably heated by one turf central fire where the milk was warmed and the teacher was greeted as master every morning. So completely different altogether than what we think of a school now. Throughout the day, open days were held to give local children and families and the wider public the chance to take part in the excavation, explore the site and ask questions. Yeah, 50, 50 females and 50 females. All the documents. All the records. We've actually got quite a bit of a lot of artifacts around here from uh, the school and from, from the houses nearby. So this is a, a piece of writing slate here. Uh, you can see the lines running across it. And uh, we've also picked up a few stylus. So these would have been used to write right on the slates. Um, we also have here, we have an inkwell, uh, the remains of an inkwell, so this also would have been used in the school. Uh, we found some other pieces from the school as well. We've got some pottery, uh, we've got an old um, spout from a teapot, which could have been the master's, master's teapot. Uh, we found some nice willow pattern plates, which uh, it's a very kind of common, common type of plate that you'd find with a, a story pattern on it. Um, and we've also found some Florence court, uh, Florence court wear which is uh, the local pottery that was made in the tylery. Um, the metal detectorist was out on Friday afternoon and he found a few bits and pieces as well. So we found an old button, uh, which could have been uh, one of the children's buttons. And we've, uh, we found a few other artifacts around, around the area as well. So uh, moving on to the cottages, we found uh, a few bits and pieces too. We've got um, some clay pipe um, along here. And we've also got some coins that we found. So this is a, probably a Victorian penny um, and it was actually one of the school children that was here on Thursday that, that found this. So it was quite nice, it was the only piece of metal that was found on site that wasn't found by the uh, metal detectorist. So uh, that, that child done particularly well on that day. Uh, it doesn't have much uh, of the detail left on it, a lot of it's corroded away so we can't, we can't see a date on there. Um, but we can, we can tell from the shape of it what, uh, what coin it was. Uh, this is a, a piece of uh, clay pipe stem, so we found a, a few of these around the school building. Um, you know, they're, they're very typical of the, the period that we're talking about here. We, we see a lot of people uh, using these at the time, so they're almost like uh, cigarette butts. You can actually find a lot of the broken stems and things on, on these post-medieval sites. But you see, this here was an addition. Yeah. And there was a little window here in this, when you came in the door, there was a small window here. Yes. And this was there to block the wind from the fire. Ah, oh, yes, yes. This was the kitchen here. Yeah, right? there was always a re-return wall opposite the door. Yes, for that just reason. The, yeah. there, there's a lot of people, I'm meeting a lot of people here that I haven't met for years. And in the olden days, my Uncle Robbie, who had this house, he had an open house. There was always Kayliers coming in. And for years, a lot of these people, I haven't seen them, but this has brought them together now. The whole thing with the bricks and the bridge and the school, this is, if you like, it's a reason for them to get together. And of course, I'm meeting these people as well and chatting about old times. Hello, mate. How are you? As well as bringing the community together, the archaeological dig at Arnie has given local children the chance to learn about their own heritage. But how valuable is this? It's very important to get young people involved. Like, at the end of the day, this is their heritage, you know, this is their history. Once we're finished, this will all be written up as a scientific report. But at the end of the day, if you can get the local children involved in it and digging up 
the school that their great granddad might have went to or the great granny. You know, it's that kind of tie in with their own history. This is an opportunity for the children from four local schools to get out and to learn about the world around us in a way that is so inclusive and that just offers an opportunity to every child, regardless of their academic ability, to learn in a different way, to learn in a contextual way. You know, yes, it's schoolwork, sort of, but the sort of real kind of, um, I suppose, beauty of today, as I mentioned earlier, is they're excavating a school. You know, so not only are they learning about archaeology, not only are they learning about Arnie, they're learning about Arnie Brick, they're learning about how children were educated years ago, they're learning about all kinds of things, they're learning about when one wee child coming back this morning said that maybe he thought he might be an archaeologist, you know. So they're learning about all these types of careers that are out there as well and just seeing the world in a different light. So what we're going to do today is we're going to make some Arnie bricks. Now what I've got to tell you is it's very, very dirty doing this job. You get covered in claggy clay. It'll be on your face, on your hair, in your clothes. There are some plastic gloves to wear, but I would recommend you don't wear them because I'll be off in no time at all anyway. We're stuck in the clay. You've got to be able to feel the clay. Now there's nothing in this clay to harm you. It's straight from the ground. It's perfectly safe. There's no fancy additives in it. It's just okay. ordinary clay, ordinary irony clay. Look, look, get your hands on it I'm and you've got soaked. to fold it like this. Fold the clay like you do if it were a bit of pastry. Because you've got to get the air out. Of it. Yeah, like that, like you're doing. Look, look, watch, watch, watch. Hands on the back and give it a roll. Turn it, give it a roll until it makes it into a sausage. A sausage? Yep. Okay, watch. Here's your, here's your clot, as it's called, and you've got to put it in that mould. And the way you do it is like this. See how I'm holding it like that? Yeah, and then let go. Oh, and it goes in the mold. Look, once watch, it's in, watch, boys. you then fold it in at the edges, yeah, and flat it down with your hand like that. I can't pick mine up. It's oh, oh, weird. Sorry. Yes, it got a right. I'm Tony Muggridge, and uh, I live in Shropshire. I'm Britain's last travelling brickmaker, and I've been invited to come over here and to restart brickmaking in Arnie. First brickmaking comes to Ireland in around about 1460, about then. And it's coming to, with the wealthy landowners and the wealthy chieftains, they, they've got the money to spend on brick. Brick is an expensive commodity at that time throughout Britain and northern France and everywhere else. Only the wealthy can afford it. So it's a statement. Anybody can have stone at that time. There were plenty of stonemasons, but there weren't many brickmakers. So the brickmakers come, and they make bricks in Roscommon, that's the earliest record, and then they're gone again. They've come from England to do that. They come back again in about 1520, and they're here for about 10 years. Again, they're making bricks for the most expensive properties in the area. But then again, there's another gap. They're just coming and they're going. They're not staying in this country. And it's not until uh, the 1780s when brickmaking starts to really take off and I think that's from navigators that is the navvies as we call them the workmen have gone to England to make bricks for the building of canals and later for railways they've come back with that knowledge and they're then passing it on to their fellow people you've got to get the excess clay off and the way you do that is put your hands together like that and scrape across scrape towards oh my you God. Oh my God. and when you get the excess clay off Put it in the middle of the table. You can put it on top of the worms, it'll keep them warm. Can you try and make it smooth? Oh my God. Yeah, just make it smooth oh, like no, that. This is so cool. Well, uh, the brick making in Fermanagh, my, my grandfather and his four brothers, or three brothers, my, my grandfather was John, there was Owen, James, and Pat. They used to make the brick and cut them ten in Skillen and Belturbet. And the, there was a five-man crew made the brick. So um, they threw the brick to Belturbet and they were coming 
home after delivering a load of bricks. They had a big cot, which would have been maybe to go to 30 ton cot. And they were coming home and in the upper lake up at Crumb Castle, Upper Loherne, the, there's a place called Trial Bay. It's a narrow gut that goes up into the country. And it was very dangerous when the wind had be coming from that area. And uh, they were coming home and a big wave hit them and filled the cot. And they had a, four of them was pulling, and they had a pull into the rush and was all near drowned at Derry Vore. So, Owen come home, they teamed the cot out and put her back on the water again and come home. And Owen in the next morning, he got up and he went to listen to ski and he paid his passage through to America. He said he'd never be drowned in the heron. There were sawmills, there was lime kilns, there was brick making, there was corn mills, and brick making and tile making and the local industry had to sustain families and there was no family control in those days, there were big families. You get anything up to 12 or 14 children in a family. They had to be fed some way. Arnie Brick seems to have started well after the plantation of Ulster. So we're talking about in the 1780s, 1790s, around about that area. And it's a cash crop, as it's called. So they would make, uh, they would cut the turf and then they would expose the clay. They would then make bricks from the clay. Right, you've done it all, you smoothed them all over. Whee! Next stage Water. is to get them out of the moulds. Yes. And the way you do that, the is way that you possible? do it How is like this. Down? You turn it, turn the whole mould, leave it on the table and turn it round in a circle. Okay. And it frees it off the table. Um, and then all you have to do is pick it up like that. The table. What? Yeah, let's pick it up. So this is the workbench. And what's important about the brickmaker's workbench is it has to be tied down. If you're not to tie it down, rope it down when it's being in use, because you're bashing the clay on the top of it all the time, there's a chance the bench would fall over. So it's tied down and staked down. So it would mean when they came to move the bench, they'd have to pull out the stakes before they could lift it up. On the side, there's a rest there, and that would be for the water tub to soak the, to soak the moulds in. And on the other side is the resting shelf, and that's where the brick moulds would be rested. So if I just put an old empty mould there, it would be waiting there for the child to come and take the mould. They would grab the, grab the mould, like that with a brick in it and run to the field, take it away to lay the bricks out. So you could have three or four moulds resting on the shelf before uh, somebody comes to take them away. They'd be busy all the time, so you'd have a rotation, the brickmaker would have to have a rotation of moulds of around about 15 to 20 moulds, continuously circulating them around. People would have made the bricks in between farming and clearing the land. And, and children would have joined in it, and the bricks were put into moulds, and then they were tumbled out on the grass. Over four months, regular brick making sessions were held by residents in Arne using the techniques taught by Tony Mugridge. It took practice to get the right consistency of clay to allow the bricks to dry without cracking. When they make the bricks, they've got to put them to dry. You can't lift them straight away. They're still soggy, wet. In fact, they look a bit like blancmange, rectangular blancmange. They feel like it as well. And that takes, in Arnie, because of the way the ground is, that takes about a week for them to be touchable, to pick up. After that week, they stand them on edge, on the long edge, and then leave them there for another week. Then they can pick them up and hack them. To make the hack, you put one brick on its edge, you put another one a finger thickness away from it, another one on top of it, and then another one next to that a finger thickness away, and so on, until you have a massive wall, probably about four foot high, but with gaps between all the bricks. And that allows the air to flow between them. Now you can always spot with an Arnie brick how they, that they've done this, because even the fired ones have fingerprints on the edges of the bricks, on the faces of them, where people have grabbed hold of them and stood them up. So you can actually tell by the fingerprints 
how old the children were that were doing it. It's just great. You've got a whole history of a community in the brick as a fossil. No, that's fine. Bricks out. There we go. To fire the bricks, you need to have a kiln. It's the only way. But the bricks are the kiln. So what they do is to dig trenches across the field and the area where they're going to fire them. These trenches are about a foot deep by about a foot wide. And probably depending on the number of bricks they're, they've got to burn, they could be around about six feet long. That's the ash pit. Now the first lot of bricks are laid head on to the ash pit. And then the second lot of bricks are laid stretcher onto the ash pit and so on until you've built a stepped arch that's so brick in every time until they come to the centre and you may have four trenches that you've got to do that to so in other words you've got a load of arches going across a trench and in between the arches they fill those up with dry bricks on the top of that they put more dry bricks so it's a, like a big rectangular stack of bricks with holes underneath the, the, kiln, the kilns had to be looked after at night because they had to be burned for 24 hours at a t constant temperature or else the brick would crack if it cooled too quickly. And the night watchman used to be given a one-legged stool to sit on. And if he fell asleep, he'd fall off and waken. And a house that I used to visit when I was about six or seven, old Mr. Wallace of the Mill, he had a one-legged stool. Now, whether it was a brick kiln stool or whether it was one he made or not, because he was great with his hands, but he, for a trick on the youngsters, he used to get them to try and sit on the one-legged stool. And there was a knack in sitting and balancing on that stool. You needed to sit down and get your elbows on your knees. And that balanced you. But if, if, you, weren't, if you tried to sit this way, you'd wobble about all over the place. When I was at school, I saw the last kill of brick being born. That was born in, it was done in Rossavella. A man the name of Patrick Monaghan owned it. And uh, I would say I was maybe nine, ten, I can't remember. But I was going to a stony school at that time. And uh, the schoolmaster, he was Richard Corrigan. And he brought the whole classes out along with Miss Rooney which was the assistant teacher down to see the killer brick being born because he said you might never see it again. Well my family have been uh, living in the Sasha area for generations past so the area is very significant it was our playground as children. My grandfather and probably generations before him made brick on our land at, in Sasha and even to this day you can see the outline of where there was five what we call brick holes. They're still evident today. And my father uh, remembers clearly working on them as a young man. It was very, very hard work. It was very intensive. And local neighbours helped each other out. And they got very, very little reward for their efforts. It was John's father, Hugh Patrick Owens, who cut and drew turf to the very last firing of brick in Fermanagh that Miles Bartley remembered from his school days. Uh, this is my father, uh, Hugh Patrick Owens, and my brother uh, clamping turf in the bog. I, I think the fact that, uh, th that we have had a family tradition in brick making all over the years has just sort of added another link into the chain from my personal point of view and to bring it even much more forward the fact that my father provided and drew the turf for the last killing that was um, burned down at uh, Dermain Bridge. From that point of view it has been very very significant for me and it has held a special place in my heart the whole project.
just pop him in. Because Miles Bartley had attended the last brick firing in Fermanagh 70 years ago, it was only fitting that he had the honour of lighting up the new brick clamp. The clamp was kept burning through the night and the following day, reaching temperatures inside of about 2,000 degrees Celsius. firing, the brick clamp was left to cool for three days and then it was ready to be dismantled. We've had the firing, everything's cooled, it's cooled earlier than I'd planned so in other words we finished the firing in, at the end of Saturday and I was expecting us to open on uh, next Friday or next Saturday, but as it is, it's cooled enough. And here we, are, here we are on Tuesday, and we're dismantling the kiln, and behind me is all the team getting on. They just can't resist it. It's like kids with sweets. Uh, the bricks have come out fantastically, and I'm really, really, I am immensely pleased with them. I am feeling a little bit like a Cheshire cat at the moment with the quality. The way they used to test for the quality of the bricks is to test them by hitting them together. Now this is called clinkers. So I've just got a couple of bricks here, as you can see just here, and I'll just go like that. That means the bricks are fired, so we've got a good quality product. Now, in modern times, if you could do that with a brick, we could sell these bricks. There's no problem with these bricks at all. They're perfectly good building bricks. But the fun thing that it's been a lovely project of what the brick makers made 100 years ago or 70 years ago, whatever, and to think that if they were here today and they heard that clinking sound, they'd be over the moon with it. I think it's been a total success for, for us all. Seasonal brick making as an additional farm income generating activity continued in Arne for about 150 years, from the 1790s to around the 1930s. Throughout this time, brick production was greatly affected by events within wider society. Um, with the peaks and troughs of brick making, then the only way they're going to be able to make a lot of money is if they've got a demand for it. Now what happens is, of course, you have the famine. And when you have the famine, there's no food. And so this workforce are trying to uh, make, make bricks and try to sell them. They can't do that, they can't get the money. The sad thing is that once that's over with, sort of in the 1880s, 1890s, the market's pretty well gone. And certainly you can see that over the whole period that by the 1920s, there's a little bit of a revival, but it's, it's, not, it's not gonna get back to where it was. Machines have come in that can make bricks a lot faster than, than people by hand. Just when that's all going to, uh, badly against them, you then have the Second World War. And in 1940, the War Ministry forbade the firing of bricks. That was all ceramics. Everybody had to stop because you can see the light from the kilns from the air. And the Luftwaffe were using British maps to bomb us. So the last thing you want to do is to have a fire burning and the ARP warden coming out saying, put that light out, because you can't get it out because it's a kiln. So it stopped it completely. And then of course after the war, concrete was readily available and it was so much cheaper uh, to produce concrete. And I know it's still cheap now and brickmakers can't compete with that. So it's the end of the industry. For me, uh, although it sounds really sad, 
I'm coming to the end of my brickmaking career. I'm getting too old to bend down in fields now and to see youngsters wanting to do it. It's got to be good. And they go away with knowing that in the future they can say to their children and their grandchildren, oh, that's where we made Arnie bricks. And they can pass on the knowledge. And that is the most important thing. It was on August 1594 and it was an important battle in that it was the first time that the Irish chieftains took on the English in an open battle. But it was also important because uh, they were not a unified uh, group of Irish chieftains. Some of them were still on the fence and they weren't coming down on one side or the other, the Irish chieftains or the English. But Maguire had no choice. His castle had been taken by the English and he was laying siege to it again to take it back. And it was the besieged soldiers in the castle who sent for help to Dublin. And this relief column was coming from Dublin to lift the siege. And Maguire decided he wouldn't wait, he would come out to the River Arnie. And the battle that happened there then became known as the Battle of the Ford of the Biscuits, because during the battle, the English had hard tack biscuits and barrels. And the barrels burst open and the river became covered in biscuits and hence the name the Battle of the Ford of the Biscuits. The Irish won that battle uh, and that gave them the confidence then for O'Neill to join the other Irish chieftains uh, to begin what then became known as the Nine Years War against the English which they eventually lost overall with the Battle of Conceal. Uh, the flight of the Earls ensued and the plantation of Ulster began. So in many, many ways, the Battle of the Ford of the Biscuits was the opening shot, the opening salvo of a very important part of Irish history. Well, if you're going to talk about the Battle of the Ford of the Biscuits, it is in August 1594, but to understand what was happening then, you've got to go back to October of 1593. Technically, Maguire had gone into rebellion, and Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone was still not in rebellion and he was supposedly loyal. So he and Henry Bagnall led an army against Hugh Maguire and they finally trapped him now against um, the River Urn here in October of 1593 and they defeated him. And this nice battle uh, map shows basically the Crown Army led by Bagnall and O'Neill crossing the river attacking a defensive position occupied by Maguire's men and then here in the background you have Maguire's men running away because they've been defeated. Now after that um, Maguire wasn't completely defeated, he lost a battle but not the war so the English decided to garrison a castle called Castle Ski or Castle Skay and that was at modern day Lisna Ski. in fact it's called Castle Balfour now today. Now from that site a guy called John Dowdle attacked and finally took um, Maguire's main castle at Enniskillen in February of 1594. And that leads us through to this nice little map, and that's actually John Dowdle here in the centre of the picture, and he's there with his Irish horse boy who is carrying his shield. Now, obviously, Maguire wasn't very happy about this, and he went to, um, so history would tell us anyway, he's gone to uh, Hugh O'Donnell and Hugh, um, Hugh O'Neill, the, le the subsequent leaders of the rebellion in uh, the north of Ireland and he got more troops and in May of 1594 the Irish then have their own siege. They besiege the English who are now inside the castle. And that goes fairly well for about a month but um, the English try sending uh, a party to break out. They can't break out and by June they're sending runners that basically have to 
sneak their way through the Irish lines at night and make their way to Cavan or Sligo or Dublin. And in June, the English say, um, our supplies aren't too bad. Um, can you please come and get us, rescue us? But be careful when you do. I know you will be careful, but you really do need to be careful because there's a lot of Irish um, surrounding this castle. Um, then, um, no mission is launched. And by July, another letter, which subsequently was the last letter that got out of the castle, said basically, we're running out of supplies. If you don't um, relieve us soon, we're going to have to do the disgraceful thing of surrendering the castle. So that gets taken very seriously. And in August um, of 1594, um, the Dublin government decide to send a relieving force up to take the castle. Wander. Right, so. You take this away, take that away. So just march on Or get it iron. I thought it was a button, it's a bit big at the back. There's a crest on that or not. Not sure. But it was a button. A bit big at the back. Is there a? Could be a button. Could be a stud. It's like brass. Brass, is mm, it? I think it is. Yeah. yeah right. Three clips in the back. Probably yeah. modern, right modern, that color. Yeah, could have been a fucker. Hello. Uh, hey, how did you find that? No, too hard. He's crying in 29. Well, once the English have decided they're going to go and have to relieve the castle, they start organising the army that they're going to send. And we know that the English commander, um, Sir Henry Duke, realises that it's going to be a hard fight in there. And he says that we need a thousand men. Um, if we go under a thousand men, it may not go very well for us. But just as we have uh, cutbacks today in the civil service and the army's getting cut back exactly the same, things never really change. Back in 1594, they don't have enough men. So Duke is told you have around 600 infantry and I think 46 um, cavalrymen. And that's his uh, army to set off. Now there would have been far more, probably maybe even up to a thousand because we have to include Obviously, the guys that are driving any wagons that are there, but most of the supplies are going to be moved on the backs of horses and ponies. So, you know, every two or three of those is going to have a man looking at. So you've got all these guys. You may even have merchants um, who are going to go in and sell goods once at the castle. So you'll have families as well at this point. Um, soldiers... Um, sometimes brought their wives with them on campaign. That sounds very strange to us now. So this big column of around 600 soldiers, 650 soldiers, and probably maybe 400 um, hangers on, shall we call them, moves off from Cavan. They set out from Cavan on the 4th of August. On the evening of the 6th of August, they arrived approximately at Knockninny, and there they camped for the night. But um, it was known they were coming, so the Irish forces who were under the command of Hugh Maguire sent some of their troops 
to surround the English camp that evening on the 6th of August and they weren't really trying to attack it too much they were just keeping the English up all night scaring them so you would imagine that you know your sentries are out and you're just starting to doze off and just as you go to sleep there's a big volley of shot so you're up and you're panicking and you're grabbing your weapon and you get ready and then there's nothing for another half an hour so you just start to go to sleep happens again and this the Irish keep the English up all night winding them up a bit make no sleep making them more nervous and that goes on through the night until dawn and then at dawn Herbert gets all his men up and he organizes them into three regiments and by about I think around 11 o'clock they have just approached the uh, what they don't know but what the Irish know is the site of the battle and here is a reconstruction drawing we have drawn of the battle you can see the Irish are coming out of cover at the rear of the English army and they're attacking and they're going to begin destroying the English pikemen at the rear and forcing them in this direction. And at the same time, you'll just see this English officer getting down into the ford and he's trying to bring his men across and cross to this side and take the fording point for the English. Now when we look in the foreground, we've drawn in some of the Irish soldiers. Now we've drawn them with red coats and we actually know that some of them would have had red coats. Um, over to the left we have an Irish officer and at the very right we know that there were Scots mercenaries probably from Hugh O'Donnell's pay when they were at the battle and instead of having calivers and muskets they had bows. So almost at this point um, the saviours have become, uh, you know, the castle garrison would nearly need to come out and save them. So it's really, it's not good. But they do rally in this area. And what happens then is they push forward and they try to set up their column once again. And they move forward and they put out their skirmishers and their caliber men to either side again to restore order. But the guy in charge of the English skirmishers, the Captain Fuller, is quickly killed his men start riding and everybody just starts panicking and the entire column then goes to pieces. That's strange. Yeah. I'm trying to rebuild it in my mind. Definitely that. Was the grooves in it? It's put me off. It's round at the end. It's not even a modern. You know, the old Mauser took a big. I would say, you know, as an archaeologist coming, we've heard the story of the battle. We know the story. Um, proving that on the ground comes from finding archaeological remains. Um, as a professional archaeologist, you would love to find, you would die to find, you know, if you find a battlefield site, you would find maybe a big pit with guys in armour and things like that and, and all the swords. But that happens very rarely. Um, when that happens, it's sort of world news. And I can only think of maybe two examples I've ever known throughout the whole of Europe like that. Um, and those are rare. What we would find here at the Battle of uh, the Ford of the Biscuits, if we were very lucky, um, there would be a pit, possibly with remains in it. But what happens at the end of a battle is that the people rob everything. Um, so you'll take all the armour, the swords, the guns, the ammunition, um, all the supplies. You'll take all the clothes, the shoes, everything. So at the very end of a battle, probably all you will find are um, dead bodies, dead mutilated bodies. So there may be very little to find. What we would expect, though, are the little pieces that um, don't get lifted up by the victors and those are bits maybe of broken swords that have got broken in hand-to-hand -hand combat buckles perhaps the odd coin and then the lead shot the bullets that are fired by the guns for generations the people living in the townlands around arnie and jermaine have passed down stories about the battle but the real debate has been where the battle actually took place I'd say it was one of the you know, greatest topics around the fireside down through the years. But the topic wasn't just the battle. I mean, the, 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 the part that would have been discussing most was where it was. Some had it at Dermain, some had it at the Ford Cheshire Arnie, 
Others had it here. It's where the old Arne villages, the Clahan. The academic historians maintain the most likely battle site to be at Germain Bridge, but this was contested by locals. I a kind of rubbish the remain because they left it off Loch Erne. Loch Erne was dropped by up to 8 to 10 feet in 1881. So uh, Loch would have been well and truly up around that area at the time. And uh, the fields there wouldn't have supported of an army of over a thousand with wagons and wheels and heavy provisions. Well, when I was a small boy, uh, the chat would come up. It was mainly about uh, the Red Medis and the... Uh, I remember asking what was all this about and they told me that it was the Battle of the Biscuits was fought down by Morris Owens and that there were stepping stones there that uh, they could cross the river and that the, they crossed over there and that the battle was on up by the Red Meadows. And uh, you didn't pass much remarks then on it to that it go by. But then there was a Two men, one was James McKenna and the other was Jack Sherry. And they wrote an article into the Havana Herald stating that the Battle of the Biscuits was fought at the Remain, which is further down the Arnie River. And the, the Sesha people, the old men, they got very angry at this being taken away from their townland. So they organised a meeting and the in the old school. And there wasn't an old man from any house there but attended. I was only about 10 or 11 year old. <coughs> and there was a big priest, he was an uncle of this James McKenna. And he actually shook the stick over McKenna's head for going to publish such a thing that he knew nothing about. You can draw a line, the, the, the forces that, the English forces that came from the south and up through Cavan and would have come round Knocknany Rock. It's there they would have decided which way to travel and they would have came the high hard ground to bring them to a crossing place on the Arnie River. I, I had an argument about a year ago with a young man and he said it was at Arnie Bridge that the cannons came down the, the old rail, uh, that old coach road and that the battle was fought there, and well, I knew rightly it wasn't. But you couldn't convey that to him. <laughs> and Miles, why do you think the site of the battle is so important to local people? Well, I don't know. It's history, you see. Well, you know what it is, there's been more action around Arnie in the last three weeks than there's been in Arnie since August 1594. You know, there's a lot been happening here. Arnie's a fairly sleepy place but there's been a buzz about here in the last three weeks. The Battle of the Biscuits is still going on. After searching at both Germain and Arnie bridges without any significant finds, the metal detectorists moved into the Red Meadows at Sesha. And we'll just see what we get. If we get nothing or if we get bored, what we'll do is we'll go back, get a cup of tea, and then we'll go over to Germain, where I think it actually is. So if you just want to go out, Enjoy yourself for a while. Okay. Don't find any musket ball. <laughs> <laughs> You've been warned. <laughs> You'll see me at Under professional supervision, local enthusiasts from across Fermanagh participated in searching the fields. My name is Hugh Mannix. All my life I've had an interest in history and in conjunction with history, archaeology I suppose as well. My hope is that somewhere, and it's a very, very faint hope, somewhere we may come across musket balls. But bearing in mind at the time of the battle, this whole countryside was had, hadn't been drained, it was wet, it was marshy, it was swampy and everything else. And a musket ball, say weighing two ounces, travelling 200 yards, they were probably firing them at an angle of 45 degrees to get the maximum range. That was probably falling from 50, 60 feet. And two ounces of lead falling into swampy ground probably 
went the long way down and subsequently grass grows over it bushes grow over it cows cows stand on it and all kinds of things and with my metal detector i've often found the tabs of coke tins maybe nearly a foot deep now they can't be more than 50 years old so you say how did they get down there they got down there because grass grew over them and fell over them and rotted and you know so the chances actually of finding musket balls is quite remote Yeah. I'm trying to. No. <laughs> Musket ball. Oh! That's our first musket ball. Um, there's two sizes of shot and weight that are quite close and they date widely apart so looking at this one without weighing it and measuring it it's either going to date to the late 1700s early 1800s or it's going to date to the time of the battle and we were probably maybe talking about caliber shot earlier and it, it could be caliber shot but this is the way it starts we'll see if we start picking up any more and we'd sort of talked that if we were going to get shot That's we would get them level. along here because if the English came through here they'd be firing at, at the Irish here and it's going to go into the slope so Jim might have found the start of the battlefield you never know it's early days I think there's still something down there very often, you know, it's, it's, it's a false trail and a false response because you see that iron there in the soil called mineralization and very often that can give you a response. But you can't really afford to ignore any Hello. Another one. Another one. Well, it's a musket ball, roughly about, uh, I would say, about an ounce weight. It's down about four inches out of the soil. The soil is fairly compacted, so hopefully there'll be more. And for some reason or another, obviously the other one was only about 30 yards away. People, they were firing muskets here anyway. So that's a start and I think it's very exciting. Have you found musket balls before? I have, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what, what does it feel like to find a musket ball there? Pardon? What does it feel like to find a musket ball like that? Well, to find anything like that, is, I think, because I never grew up, it's wildly exciting. <laughs> what more can I say? Uh, things don't have to have a monetary value to have a value to a, somebody who has a metal detector. It, it, it's the finding of something. that It's a thrill in itself. It's, it's a little boy in me looking for treasure. Very, very old little boy, but nevertheless a little boy at heart. Another musket ball, similar to the, the other one I found. You usually get them, you get a hot spot. Once you, once you get one, you usually get a hot spot and there's a few. And it just so happens that these four have been found in one line along here. There could have been a hedgerow along here, where they took cover if they were firing or being fired at. How many balls do you have? I think we're about 15. 
what we're doing today is um, we're marking the, the finds from the, the metal detecting. So um, uh, the guys and all, all the volunteers have been out earlier on this morning and the, um, the metal detectors have been out and they've marked their, their spots and we have to come along drawing little maps. On Monday we'll be coming back with um, GPS and we'll be surveying in our, our find spots um, so that we can uh, relate this to the map. It was a battle of such a major proportions that it wasn't safe for anyone who didn't want to take part in it to be there. So the mothers, children, grannies, grandas, older folk, young folk, went to a hill locally here to this day and known as Mon on the Van, the hill of the women. They almost would have had a ringside seat or a gallery seat of the battlefield because Mon the Ban looks right down the Shesha Valley, right down towards the Zani River. <laughs> Well, it's been a good day. It's been a long day. We've been here since about 10 o'clock. I suppose it's about 5 o'clock now. Eh? And you can probably see in the hill behind us now, there's some little white poles. Each of those is showing a find from the battlefield. And uh, what we do is we go along and where we find the metal detected finds, we put in a pole, we record it and we move on. And what they're showing is lead shot or bullets. Um, and what we think is happening now is that the, we might have actually found the battlefield and that it may not be at Tremaine, as uh, we've said before, and I suppose it's not going to really matter as long as we find it. And what we think, we've, we've been here today because it's the Red Meadows and they're just off camera here across to the site. And what we're thinking about is that the local story is that the battle is out here to my right but it actually looks like what might be happening is that the Irish troops are in a line along here and they're firing up behind me to the English troops who are moving along this ridge line trying to get into Enniskillen. And what's happening then is as the bullets fire up into the hill, they've just embedded themselves into the hill and they haven't gone too deep because if you imagine they're not going down, they're going into the slope. So they've only maybe gone about this deep into the ground and we're finding them quite easily. So, we're not sure, we'll have to do a bit more work and analyse the bullets and have a look at them, but at the minute there's two possibilities. Either we find the battlefield or we find some sort of militia target range, shooting range from maybe about 1800. And we're just keeping those two options open. But what we're going to do is come back and we'll do a bit of work behind me now. We found what may be the battle in two fields and we're going to have a look now behind us when we come back maybe in May or June and we'll have a look at further fields and if we find more shot that way then I'm pretty sure that we're going to find the battlefield here. In the following months the team moved into the field adjacent to the Arnie River. Based on knowledge provided by local residents the team searched the areas felt to be the most likely crossing point. Metal detection here uncovered three slugs. These are lead bullets designed to pierce armour and bring down cavalry horses. It's amazing, isn't it? Morris, do you see it? I see that. I see that. It's going to be dunt on it. So, I mean, it's going to kill somebody, happened. that Morris. Well, I bet you what's happened is that it's actually hit and it's ricocheted and it's gone into the ground here. So whatever it's hit somewhere over here, it's just come off and yeah. come into the if ground. It's, if it's hit a piece of armour or something. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, isn't that amazing? We were talking about those. <laughs> Ireland is full of battlefields from prehistory right up to more modern times. And some of them are known, but when we go back into this period of the 16th century, the Nine Years' War. Very few are actually known where they are. People might say it's in this field or here, or it's in a general area, but it's very difficult to actually find a battlefield on the ground. And what we like to do as battlefield archaeologists is be able to actually create a story of the battle and then put it on the landscape. And at the Battle of Conceal, which happened in 1601, right down at the very south of Ireland, the archaeologists looking for that haven't quite been able to find the actual battlefield. And uh, In Ireland at this period we've only found one battle before and that's the Battle of Yellow Ford in County Armagh which is four years after this battle. 
that's the only one that we could actually, I could take you to a field and say, like, well, this is what happened here. And then if you look there, that's what happened here. So if, if we've got this right now and that we can find this, and this is definitely the battlefield, this is be the only the second one I know of anyway at this period in Ireland that we've actually found to that degree, that we'll be able at the end of this um, project, be able to say the English moved along here and this happened in this field and that happened in that field and so that people could actually go out with a wee guidebook and walk the line of the battle. And that would be quite an amazing thing to be able to do. Someone who has extensively walked the land around Arnie is the internationally renowned ethnographer and writer, Professor Henry Glassy. In 1972, Henry spent a whole year living amongst the communities in the townlands from Ross Downey and John Bargay to Jermaine and Sesha, collectively known as Belly Minone. As part of the Battles, Bricks and Bridges project, Henry returned to Fermanagh to talk about the past and meet old friends. Well, I think if I have to supply a name for myself or some kind of a label, I would call myself a folklorist. And it was as a folklorist when many years ago I came first to this district in the county for Manor. I chanced to have in front of me the, the two books that I've written on Valley Manor. Actually, I wrote, there are really four, but these are the two main ones. This is the first of them, and this is the second of them. The first of them, Passing the Time in Valley Manor, effectively is a full ethnography. The later book, The Stars of Valley Manon, was somewhat governed by the fact that there's a CD with uh, songs and stories and the like, and so that we, this book really features the oral literature of the community, whereas this book talks about everything. How does Henry feel about the locally held belief of Sasha as the crossing point and the Red Meadows as the battle site now looking very probable? I'm not surprised. But it doesn't surprise me for a reason that I think is worth a, a minute's talk. And that is that generally what one thinks about the, a community's historical knowledge is that these are people that have heard vague old stories and are repeating them. That's not true in this community and it's not true in many communities in the world. This is a community in which the historians name themselves historians thought of their work as being professional, even though it was oral, and thought of their work as necessary because they didn't believe that the history in books accurately represented their community. I guess it was only yesterday John Owens, Hugh Patrick Owens' son, took me and stood on the place where the archaeologists suggested that the battle took place. Well, in 1972, his father took me to that exact spot, and if you stand just where that hill begins to rise, and look across the Red Meadows and towards the crossing rocks at the ford, that's exactly where it seems always to have been centered. Further metal detection in the Red Meadows has now uncovered about 40 more lead shot in a very small area. This does support the view that some kind of militia target range may have been located here. It will take very careful exploration now to distinguish primary battlefield evidence from finds connected to a possible target range. But the Red Meadows remain the focus of exploration. The historians are confident, however, that the place where the slugs were found was the crossing point where the English army forded the river. Crossing over the Arnie River and moving south, the challenge now is to find evidence of the exact route taken by the English column as it marched from its last camp at Knocknany. Further metal detecting here has uncovered tantalising objects, including old coins and possible fragments of weaponry. But the team really need to find musket and calibre bullets and so far these have proved elusive. However, by walking the landscape and studying the 1835 first edition Ordnance Survey map of the area, the historians are now confident that the route avoided the thick bogs and swampy wetlands in the valley floors and picked its way along the narrow strip of higher ground that rises at Clunty Mullen and then works its way across the hilltops 
leading back to Knocknany. This theory is supported by the direct view of Clunty Mullen and the meadows dropping to the Arnie River that can be seen from the distant hill of Mullinaban. It is now believed that as well as the women and old folk, the Irish commanders also used this vantage point to direct their ambush of the English column. To sum up the battlefield exploration so far, finding evidence to locate the probable crossing point at Sesha has been an amazing achievement of national significance. But what does it mean to local people? I think the legacy is that what we have been talking about for years has now been established. And it, it is no longer like a vague history in the past. It is now very alive and getting more interesting day by day. So it's in its infancy. There's a lot more to be learned about the Battle of the Ford of the Biscuits. The new knowledge being discovered through this project has also renewed awareness about the historical importance of the battle itself. This battle really is the start of the war. It's hard to really put a start in anything. You could say what started the First World War, what exact moment, what exact moment started the Second World War. If we go back into late 1593, the war is starting. But after this battle, um, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth in London decides that she is going to bring some of her men that she currently has fighting in Brittany and northern France. And she's going to bring them secretly back to the north of Ireland and try and put an end to this rebellion before it gets real legs and gets taken off. And there is really no big fight between she takes that decision in around the early autumn and between this, which is in late summer. So this battle must have um, made her think again and made her do that. So with this battle, you could definitely say this is the start of the Nine Years' War. The next big battle um, really isn't to almost a year later, just under a year later in uh, June, July uh, at Clontibra. Um, not that far away, really. So it's a very important battle. Um, it really marks the start. It also marks the place, I think, afterwards that you, Neil, can't deny any longer that he's not really secretly in the rebellion anymore. From this battle, they know clearly that Hugh Maguire is in rebellion. They know that he's been helped by given soldiers by Hugh O'Donnell. And Hugh O'Donnell, the Earl of Turconnell, well, not sorry, the Earl of Turconnell, but Lord of Turconnell, Lord of Donegal, basically. He um, was said to be present sometimes at the siege of the castle, the Irish siege of the castle in Enniskill. And so he's heavily implicated. He's lent troops. And Cormac McEnbaran, the brother of Hugh O'Neill, is at this battle with Hugh O'Neill's soldiers. So I think with this, the game is out, definitely. Everybody knows that the war is on. And as I say, the Queen takes it very seriously and brings her soldiers out of Brittany and brings them into the north of Ireland. And we would also look and say that nine years later, 1602, 1603, when you, Neil, is, the war's been fought and we've had the Battle of Conceal and the Spanish have landed and been defeated and O'Neill has retreated right back up into the north again. His, the very last things that have happened to him, he has pulled out of Dungannon and he's hiding, they say, in the woods of uh, South Derry. But he still has a channel open to him and he moves down, possibly even the, the Clocker Valley, into Fermanagh. And one of the last things in the war is to cut off his uh, lifeline into Fermanagh. So in some ways you can say Fermanagh is there at the start of the war and Fermanagh is there at the end of the war. It's an important place. My name is Reggie Cunningham. I'm the chairman of Kilesher Community Development Association. I think the project was a fantastic opportunity for the people who have lived here for several generations and weren't socialising together with each other and for those who have come into the area more recently and don't have that history, the family history that goes back for generations. And there have been quite a few people who have moved into the locality lately who have taken a fantastic interest in this project. I think also, the participation of the school children in the project was very important because it will give them a sense of belonging to the area. They've learned more about the history 
of the area. And I would think they will remember being here and making brick and learning about brick making and the battles and knowing the history of the bridge which brings the two communities together over the Arni River which is the dividing line between the two communities. I think it's very important and I think they will remember that for a long time and hopefully they will tell that history to their children who will also have an appreciation of the area that they come from. The project that's happening along the Arnie River at this moment, Battles, Bricks and Bridges, is just wonderful. It's a wonderful way that people can get a grip on their own history, effectively and convert it into something like heritage. And it's a, it's their, their excitement at this moment is something that probably wouldn't have been possible 40 or 50 years ago because at that point they, things wouldn't feel imperiled. So in a way, this is, this is people fighting against loss with a great victory of the gathering of information and making it available to everyone.